Welcome to Hogwarts. Now, in a few moments, you will pass through these doors and join your classmates. But before you can take your seats, you must be sorted into your houses. They are Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. Imagine crafting your own wall art. Maybe it's a passion that fascinates you, or maybe it's the promise of an immersive creative experience like no other. A piece of iconic art you can build for yourself. Relax and reconnect with your creative side. We've created unique soundtracks curated around the world of art, animation, music, and movies. And in this soundtrack, we go behind the scenes of the design of the Harry Potter movies and speak to some of the designers that made it happen. We're also gonna meet the Lego designer who created the Lego art of the four crests that you might be working on right now and get a peek behind the curtain of what it's like working at the Lego group. You can listen as you build at your own pace and get the inside story. All right, ready to dive in? Uh, but first, let me just put on the sorting hat. Ah, right then. Mm, right, okay. I know, Hufflepuff. I'm Andrea Collins. I'm a Hufflepuff. Welcome to Lego Art. Before you start building, you might also want to find out which Hogwarts house you belong in. If you don't have a sorting hat, like me, you can do that by attending the official sorting ceremony on wizardingworld.com. Our first guests are graphic designers Mira Foramina and Eduardo Lima. Welcome. Now, can you please introduce yourself and tell us what house you're in? Hi, I'm Eduardo Lima. And I am, together with Mira Foramina, a lead graphic designer on all the Harry Potter films and Fantastic Beasts as well. And I am a very proud Ravenclaw. My name is Mira Foramina. Uh, together with Eduardo, I am the lead graphic designer currently on Fantastic Beasts and on all the Harry Potter films. And I am a humble Hufflepuff. <laughs> <laughs> and what does that mean about you? Uh, Ravenclaw. One of the the, no, the 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 characteristics of Ravenclaw is to be intelligent, wisdom, wit, and and love learning. And and someone else recently said to me that also is sparkling and colorful. <laughs> wow. So yeah. So I, I think I think I fit some of those characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. What about you, Mirafora? How would you describe a Hufflepuff? Uh, well, um, they do say that they work hard, but to be honest, I think any of us in this creative field is probably true true to all of us. Um, I do have a lot of patience, so I think that is is true, um, and dedication, and um, probably don't like talking about myself, actually. So there you go. That's probably quite a Hufflepuff. <laughs> <laughs> so a Hufflepuff and a Ravenclaw. The lead graphic design team behind the Harry Potter movies, Mira Foramina and Eduardo Lima. Together, you're Mina Lima, which is also the name of your design studio and your gallery and store in London. Mira Fora, you told me I can just call you Mira, yeah? Yeah, you can use Mira. <laughs> but Mira Fora is such a beautiful name, no? Mira. We always say about that. It looks like that comes from the wizarding world. <laughs> I agree. Actually, I have been asked that. <laughs> it was a wizard name. <laughs> but Mira, there's lots of coincidence no, with M, M, no? Marodis Ma. I mean, never am I going to go near a foreign mina. <laughs> Mad Eye Moody. Ah. It's almost like your name led you into your career. Oh, I think nothing is unconnected in this world. <laughs> mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us a bit about your backgrounds leading up to becoming graphic designers for the Harry Potter movies? I, I studied uh, visual communication, specialization in graphic design. I'm from Brazil, so I studied in Rio. And I moved to the UK in 2000. Uh, while I was doing my graphic design course, I also started working in film. That was my dream. Since I was a young boy, I always had my eyes in filmmaking and storytelling. And uh, I started working in Brazil in film editing. And uh, was when I moved to, to the UK that I met Mira Foramina. And uh, she gave me an, an amazing opportunity that I, I am so grateful and I will be grateful for the rest of my life. She offered me like a, uh, some work experience on, on the second Harry Potter film. 
And uh, since then, Nomira will never stop working together. So and next year is going to be a fantastic year and it's very special for us. It's gonna, we're going to be celebrating 20 years that we are working together. Wow. <laughs> and, and Mira, what, what led you to the Harry Potter world? Um, well, apart from my name, obviously, <laughs> just as previously discussed, um, I trained in theatre design, set, set design for theatre, and then went on to do study set design for film. So I was very much heading in the direction of thinking about the whole scenic design side of things rather than honing in specifically on something so detailed as graphic design. And so I kind of carved out this space for myself um, working as a graphic designer in film, uh, probably about 10 years before, maybe eight years before I started working on Harry Potter. And, and in that time I had been lucky enough to get to work with Stuart Craig, the fantastic production designer of the set, all the sets on Harry Potter. So because I was working amongst his team, when he got the job of designing Harry Potter, he took his team with him. So it was a very sort of natural, uh, transition from, one freelance job to the next and not really knowing what was going to unravel from that point on. But Mira, it was quite funny you know, uh, when he said to you, you know, oh, it's a film about a, a orphan wizard boy and let's see how it goes. Maybe it's going to be like, I don't know, five months job. <laughs> <laughs> 20 years later, we are here talking and loving Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, and I might just add to that, actually, is that together with that idea was uh, realizing that we were working amongst really best people in the industry. And it not only were we helping each other to understand how to resolve problems, but also becoming a little bit of a family. And some of those people who I think you'll also be speaking to here. We all sort of grew up together. That feels like a very special sort of gift to have been given, especially as a freelancer, to have this uh, loyalty to to each other and to shape that world together. So that that was a, a very unusual part of the experience of working on the Harry Potter films. Mm -hmm. And as Mira said, uh, Livesden, we used to call Livesden Hogwarts because lots of young people went there and kind of learn through the films and they all became amazing artists and carpenters, painters. Wizards. Wizards, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the amount of talent and, and creativity that runs through the art department on Harry Potter, but especially for me because I arrived from Brazil and, was, and Harry Potter was my first introduction to the film industry in this country. So I was absolutely, yeah, gobsmacked. <laughs> Now, while you're here, your house will be like your family. Your triumphs will earn you points. Any rule breaking and you will lose points. At the end of the year, the house with the most points is awarded the House Cup. We'll hear much more from Mina Lima later in this soundtrack. But now let's bring in our next guest. Please introduce yourself and let us know what Hogwarts houses you belong to. Hello, I'm Alan Gilmore. I am an art director and production designer, and I was uh, from the Harry Potter family. I am a Ravenclaw, so apparently I'm intelligent, I'm curious, and I'm creative. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Pierre? My name is Pierre Bahana. I uh, have had the great pleasure of running the prop manufacturing departments and all the Harry Potter series of films and also Fantastic Beasts. I've been sorted twice just to confuse matters. So, so once Slytherin and once Gryffindor. I think I err uh, slightly to the Slytherin, to be honest. So, yeah, a bit dodgy, maybe. <laughs> and Andrea, I can vouch for that. Yeah. <laughs> now, a prop maker. So how do you get into prop making? What was your background? I, after leaving school, I essentially served a series of apprenticeships in mold making and engineering in, on car projects and then boats and then worked for a boat builder. And then after I stopped doing that, I started at a small model making special effects company in London in the sort of back end of the 80s, really, that uh, specialized in doing TV commercials. So I started there and then I, you kind of go freelance when you enter that world eventually after I did my apprenticeships at the effects company and you just go from job to job. So I started did TV stuff, things like um, spitting image and stuff for Hattrick Productions and and then slowly started getting into films, started doing 
um, work on that. And then you it just grows and grows. And then very soon got asked to run um, a prop manufacturing department on Titanic. And then on it goes from there. We did one films and eventually, uh, eventually came to the Potter series. Wow. Titanic and Harry Potter. That's pretty iconic. That's very, very neat. Alan Gilmore, your official title is creative director for the film series, but you were originally an architect. Is that right? Yes, I, I come from the world of architecture many, many years ago. Um, creative director is one of many titles, kind of mainly an art director and um, working on the team at Pierre at the films. But yes, I, I came from being an, an architect and I qualified in Dublin. Um, never actually really wanted to be an architect. I was always very interested in films, but I went into architecture to try and learn about design and creativity. And as I, after I graduated, I had a very lucky break. A friend of a friend um, told me of a, a film that was looking for people to draw facades of buildings. And I didn't really know what this entailed, but I applied and myself and two friends got the job. And it was a film called Michael Collins in Dublin. It was a British film crew. And I have to say, it was just amazing working with them, the skills they had. And I was enthralled from that point on. So I knew this was going to be my life. And I basically followed them to London and started knocking on doors, trying to meet people, trying to get into the film industry. And again, another lucky break, I met Stuart Craig, who was our leader on Harry Potter. He's the main production designer. So yeah, it's been a really long journey. And all along the way, many other films, many many places, many countries. Um, it's an amazing world to be in. Um, and it's, it's, it's very... It's, it's hard to say how you describe the, the buzz you get from it. But the, the, the jobs are all so different. The people you meet are so different. And you end up with this huge family globally. Wow. So, so do you read the books before joining the team? Yeah, generally you'll read the book if there's a book. Um, and also very quickly we get the scripts. So the script is a condensed version of the book. And it's, it's the story that the director wants to tell and the, the creative team. And on Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling was very involved in, the, in taking the books and condensing them down to a, a size that fits a, a film, the, the amount of minutes you have, maybe 120 minutes, 150 minutes. And the scripts tend to be very, very descriptive. So the art department our, and Pierre's team, my team, we would take our scripts and we'd start to look at them in great depth. And the script would say, for example, interior great hall. So you'd have to think, what is a great hall? And we'd work with Stuart Craig, our, our leader, and he would go off and research ideas. And Stuart, Stuart is a visionary, by the way. He just has amazing, amazing ideas. And we're all, we all worship the ground he walks on, the, the creativity he gives off to all of us. And he empowers all of us so much to be creative as well. Wow. But yeah, we, we, we read the books, we get the scripts, and then we all kind of get together and huge, huge teams work together to create these worlds. How many people would be on a team like that? Gosh, on, on Harry Potter, our average art department would have been just the depart the room I was in was probably about 50 or 60 people. That's the mm. set designers, art directors. But then you have graphics, you have PRC and the prop team, the set decorating team. We have all these other creative teams all the way down to the guys who build the sets, the painters, the sculptors, um, huge amount of people just just around the art. And then many more people around that. Pierre, you could probably speak to the number of people. Yeah, I mean, the crew size is interesting. I mean, it's interesting in the series of films because I think <clears throat> the Potter films, you know, went on for about 10 years. So they, they the development in techniques and the sort of size and scale of the films grew as well. I mean, my crew size for the on um, Philosopher's Stone or Sorcerer's Stone was about 15 core people. We got a slightly bigger sort of at the peak points. But by the time we got to Deathly Hallows, I had 40 to 50 people working full time for the whole series. So you could probably apply that to, to most departments that the films got bigger and the departments got bigger and also what what we were charged with and the confidence of what we were doing sort of grew in all aspects. Really. Yeah. So it was an interesting experience in that sense. What's it like to see it all come together when you're watching those movies for the first time? I think for me, it's it, the great thing about seeing the film is that we haven't been working on the film for at least 12 months after we finished on it. So there's a good aspect of, of forgetting half of what we've done initially and almost sitting there like a, like anyone else and being sucked in by the whole world. I, you know, that is, if that happens, if you just get, if you're, if you're, um, if you're enjoying it like any other member of the audience would do, then I think you've actually made a good film because it's, it's working as a storytelling experience it's only you know when you have to think oh christ i've got to go back and see it again now to just to just to go and pick out the bits and and look at them in with a professional eye but, mm -hmm. and it, and you know they they applied everything we did so well there was you know every aspect was was um was used and and in and, and helped to enrich the whole world of it so it was yeah it's a very complimentary um series of films to work on wow 
Wing Guardian Leviosa. Guardian. Look, stop, stop, stop. You're going to take someone's eye out. Besides, you're saying it wrong. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. You do it then if you're so clever. Go on, go on. Guardian Leviosa. Wing Guardian Leviosa. See here, everyone. This Granger's done it. <laughs> Splendid. We're talking to you guys today because of a new Lego art set. Do you have history, each of you, playing with Lego bricks and sets? I certainly do. I've been playing with Lego since I could walk, basically. I've had Lego for a long, long, long time. Drove my parents crazy, always wanting Lego and I still buy it and I've my children buy it and we have so much Lego in our house in London that this, you can hardly walk around the house now. It's uh, <laughs> ridiculous. I have a huge Harry Potter Lego collection, a huge collection of some other um, genres and stories, but the Harry Potter collection in our house is very valued and very prized. Yeah, same for myself really. I, don't know, I grew up with um, boxes full of the stuff that you inherit or you, you, you grow every Christmas and birthday and everything in between. Um, most of my stuff normally got made in some sort of plane or flying infant that went out my bedroom window, exploded on uh, on impact, and I had to run back down and put it back together and do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I think every parent has that um, can relate to that. Exactly, it's not only the Hoover that's the Lego eater; it's the lawnmower as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What about you, Mira and Eduardo? Do you also have a history playing with Lego bricks and sets? Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> when I was young, I used to pretend that I I used to love space, and uh, I used to create like spaceships and towers and thing, everything to, to do with space and planets and traveling and because my dream also was to become an astronaut for a bit and now the space and it really scares me i don't want to go out there at all <laughs> <laughs> but with with yeah making uh, uh creating the world using the lego yeah it was brilliant and i still have some lots of lego and that i sometimes i i do play <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Mira? Oh, absolutely, definitely. <laughs> Growing up in the 70s, I think that was a slightly less choice of things, but obviously um, what an amazing way for any imagination to be let loose because I think at the time there wasn't specific sets that had already been designed. So, you know, it was just the bricks, as I remember. So it was very much up to the user to go wild. And I have to say, it's the only toy or box of toys that I've kept from my son. I, it, the, the one thing I, when I was doing a big clear out sort of in the garage, it was like, this can't be given away to a charity shop. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's the one box that's sitting waiting in the garage for its next life. <laughs> Now, Lego art is different from the normal Lego sets. It's a two-dimensional building experience and more for decoration. Uh, we sent you a set to build. Did you try it? Well, we started. We started. Uh, with good <laughs> intention, you know, and, and um, but it also coincided with um, us opening a new shop, moving our studio, um, and starting working on a film and oh and a pandemic um, so we, it, 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 it'll be a very good escape from all of those real world things but um what a wonderful departure from everything wonderful. that we yeah. knew about 3d lego yeah fantastic yeah it's so many things that we can do with that and i'm so it's amazing yeah. And the set we're talking about today features the crests from the four hogwarts houses what do you think of them well, you know, it's funny when we, the, our role as graphic designers is, as I mentioned before, that it's so driven by detail. And if you'd said to me a few years ago, yeah, those detailed designs could be translated into a grid of, you know, brickwork, <laughs> um, it felt like an antithesis. And it, how could you possibly marry the two things? But um when you have an idea that is so strong, like Lego, it's just brilliant that you can translate that to absolutely anything. So what a joy for us to sort of know that something so detailed can be in, reinterpreted and still understood. It's sort of like a language. It's like Lego's got its own language that, and, and you just apply that to anything and it can be understood by anybody. So yeah, 
It's amazing. Well, also, Mira, now, while we were working on the films, we didn't have no idea that the house crests would become so important and would be even a way to identify people. Now, now people now say, I am a Ravenclaw, I am Gryffindor, I'm Slytherin or, or Hufflepuff. So no one had an idea that would become... So, so, so yes, it is incredible how the love for the houses and how people identify with each house and having the image to illustrate that is, mm -hmm. is fantastic. Well, what about you, Alan and Pierre? Did you try to build the Lego art sets we sent you? I did, yes. Yeah, brilliant. Um, some really cool ideas. For, very much in the world of, gra in the graphic style way, the pixelation of the images and how you build them and the various options. You can have several different images. I, I think it's a fantastic product and I love the whole genesis of it and, and the whole story behind it. It's really clever. No, it's a, it's, it's a great product. We, I, um, uh, when it came to me, my sister was staying with us with her niece and nephew, so we all did it together, and that was fantastic. It was great fun. It was great. It, that was a aspect I wasn't expecting. Actually, it was just a you know collaborative um, experience, and yeah, it looks fantastic as well. Now, the set we're talking about today it, it features the crests from the four houses of Hogwarts. What do you think of them? I, I think it's a great idea to celebrate the crests because they really are the the four corners of the world of Harry Potter and Hogwarts and to educate people on these worlds and these places and to educate them they can go and research more about these places and what they what they represent I think it's it's a really good starting point for a, a product in this type of genre anything off the trolley dears no thanks I'm all set we'll take the lot whoa And speaking of Lego art, we're now joined by the Lego designer behind the set. Could you start by introducing yourself and, of course, tell us what house you're in? Hi, I'm Kit Kosman, and I am a designer working for the Lego Group. And uh, I see myself as a Hufflepuff. <laughs> I took a test, and it turned out I turned out to be a Hufflepuff. Uh, and I think I'm actually like there's most of the things that uh, you consider being a Hufflepuff. I can. I can cross that on my list. I'm friendly and loyal, <laughs> honest, and I'm very hardworking. The only thing is that uh, when it comes to being uh, competitive, I am probably a bit more competitive than a normal Hufflepuff, especially <laughs> when I play games. But, <laughs> but but I'm pretty much a Hufflepuff. You know, I would, of course, like to be a Gryffindor, but I'm Hufflepuff. And that's also okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Hufflepuff, uh, before Hufflepuff was like the, the, the house that everyone like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Hufflepuff. But now with Fantastic Beasts and Newtis Commander being now a very good example of how Hufflepuff should be. And everyone now is much more... Uh, proud of to say that they are half a buff. <laughs> exactly, that's how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us about your background uh, leading up to working at the Lego Group? Uh, I was originally that, uh, educated a fashion designer from the Danish design school in Kolding. And then uh, they were looking for a person who could do especially door closes for uh, a line they called uh, Lego Scala. And I applied for that job, so I actually started my career by doing doll clothes. So that's a bit <laughs> funny, isn't it? It's <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Then, uh, then later on, I moved on to doing to, to to building as well. But in the beginning, I was actually more or less hired in to do doll clothes. Wow, doll clothes! What a way to start. Now, what other products have you worked on at the Lego Group? Oh, I've been there a lot of years. So I started off working for Lego Scala, who was a like it was a building system where you made like big dollhouses uh, and had like dolls with real hair that you could dress. Then I moved up on to Belleville, who was kind of a dollhouse um, franchise as well. Further on to Clickets, that was very much about jewelry and interior. Then I worked on Classic, that was what you talked about, Mira, having like the, the bricks, the normal bricks that you can put together in many ways. So a more classic approach on Lego. Then I moved on to 4 Plus, who was for, yeah, as it says, for, for children, that is four and over. Also worked for Duplo, and that was also different because you had to work with very small children. And the approach there is, is very different from the rest of, of uh, the franchises that we have in the legal group. 
And then finally, now I'm in Lego art and I am very thrilled to be here because I think I finally get to all my passion points that kind of come together in one job. So I am very, very happy to be here. So that's my story so far. <laughs> oh, are you doing magic? Let's see them. <clears throat> Sunshine daisies, butter mellow. Turn this stupid fat rat yellow. Are you sure that's a real spell? Well, it's not very good, is it? Now, as we talked about before, traditional Lego building is three-dimensional, mm -hmm. and this Lego art is two-dimensional. Mm. How is this task different? Oh, when you make the 3D models, uh, then, of course, like a model has to be seen from all angles. So it's like you have to take a 3D approach on it. Also, like play-wise, you need to be able to approach the model from more places, uh, much more functions. There's normally much more functions in in when you make a, a 3D model. And of course, that is very different from the Lego art where it's a, it's a, it's a piece that you, you put up on your wall. So it doesn't have to have functions and has, doesn't have to be seen from the backside. Mm -hmm. now, and it's something completely new for the Lego group and it's for adults. And in the booklet that comes with the Lego art set, it says, relax and reconnect with your creative side. Can you tell us a bit more about that and, and why it's so appealing just now? Yeah, especially with uh, COVID-19 and everything. Like we really mm -hmm. found a gap here. Um, I think in this world that we are living in, there's, uh, there's a lot of things that you need to do and not so many things that you actually would like to do. So our approach here is actually that we would like to make a product that, uh, that give people the time to kind of relax and have some nice me time while they listen to the podcast and just enjoy the moment. So, so that is, that is the, the aim for this beside also making a, a astonishing piece that you would like to put on your wall and brag about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and how did you decide to recreate the Harry Potter house crests in Lego bricks? Oh, when, when you start, uh, like when I first got the, uh, Got, we first got the idea to do uh, Harry Potter. We had a lot of other ideas. There was like, we were talking about doing the faces of, of the main characters, uh, doing uh, artifacts. Uh, there was all kinds of idea up in the air. So I started out actually by interviewing a very good friend of mine who is a, a big Harry Potter fan and asking him like, you are an adult, what would you like to have on your wall? And he said, like, we ended up like saying, okay, the quest that is something that is uh, that is very representative for Harry Potter. Like people that are Harry Potter fans would would uh, recognize that. But beside that is also it's it's a it's a nice thing to talk about. Like when you have something on your wall, it's it's also a conversation starter. So in that way, it's also nice that 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 people kind of can signal which house they belong to. So that's why we ended up doing the quests. Now, Alan, as you had mentioned, you played a huge part in bringing the iconic locations from the stories to life. Can you give us some examples and just tell us a little bit more about that? It's fascinating. Yeah, sure. Um, so again, we mentioned that we had quite a large team in the arts department, and you, you need that because the, the books are so detailed and so they go to so many places. So the, the best process was to break it down into what we call a set list. Um, we list all the rooms that are written about and what they are and how big they might be. and then each of us would be given a, a part of that to design. So, for example, I got the Quidditch World Cup Stadium at one time. Um, I got the wooden bridge that leads to the castle and many other amazing places. And we all work together to join our ideas together to make sure it's seamless. Um, extremely complex designs to work on. Again, they come from Stuart. He would envisage it with a, what's called a concept sketch or a piece of artwork. And then we would we'd make those real. And that piece of artwork within it would have also elements for Pierre, elements for Mina Lima, elements for everybody to all work on. But it's it's really fantastic to to take these ideas and make them into real places and then to watch the film and see what you worked on look absolutely real and all the fans in the world go, wow, look at that bridge or look at that stadium. It's very, very emotional mm -hmm. to, to see it and see the final version in the film. Now, what can you tell us about the house sections of the Quidditch pitch? 
Well, they each get a tower. Um, the Quidditch pitch is a very unique design. All came from J.K. Rowling's head. But yeah, each tower has a each house has a tower, and it's decorated in their colors, their their Quidditch robe colors. Um, it's a place where they go. They're all kept separate, which is a good good thing as well because they're gonna be quite. They're not the the most least. It can be quite aggressive sometimes these students, and the sport really brings out that aggression. <laughs> so it was always a great moment to watch the matches being played, and to watch Harry and Ron and um, all the other characters all battling it out, and and also watching them training and learning how to play Quidditch. But the the Quidditch arena is very unique, um, very dynamic. I love the sequence when they're flying around the edge through all the beams, and it's it's almost reminiscent of Star Wars in a way, going through the the Death Star, and it's kind of got this real dynamic. Um, space and we've, we've tried to recreate that several times since with other designs around the world in Harry Potter. Looks like he's going to be set. He's got the snitch. Harry Potter receives 150 points for catching the snitch. Gryffindor wins. Yeah! Yeah! Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, can you tell us about the Great Hall where we're first introduced to the Hogwarts houses? Well, the great, the great, the great hall. Like really, all of Hogwarts, um, through Stuart's research, is based on um, old English and Scottish castles and the, the kind of spaces that they would have. Um, they would have, they'd have towers. They would have many great rooms. But generally, they, they would have a great hall, um, a gathering room for everybody. So that's where the the genesis of the great hall came from. But then again, Stuart elevated its its experience beautifully with the. The amazing details, the flambeaux, the paintings on the walls, the huge tables, one table for each house, the high table for all the teachers and for the headmaster. And it, it really it, it evokes a classic old school feeling. Um, we, we, we all learn about these old, famous old schools in Europe, and it feels like a kind of a boarding school in a way, but a very special one. Um, and it's a school that is elevated in reality. It's You'd never find it, but it feels absolutely real. And it, it borrows from again Scotland, England. There's parts of France in there. There's many different places that we 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 we, we, we learned from and put those details into the, into the school and the Great Hall. Harry Potter. Hmm, difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind either. There's talent. Oh yes, and a thirst to prove yourself. But where to put you? Not Slytherin. Not Slytherin. Not Slytherin, eh? Well, if you're sure... Better be... Gryffindor! When it it comes to the Great Hall in real life, when when you're filming the film, how big is that room actually? How, How do they translate that... What we what the actors would be seeing into film? Well, it's it's real. It's a huge, wow. huge room. It's it's so real. The floor is actually stone, and the tables are all oak, and they're beautiful. Um, it's been re- it's actually been recreated in London at the Harry Potter tour, and it's stunning, really stunning. When you walk in there the first time, and it's about I don't know, Pierre, would it be about thirty feet high, thirty five feet high? Yeah, I think it's thirty six feet, isn't it? Thirty six, and then the rest of it would be ex- extended through visual effects or through model making. Um, many tricks to make it feel like you saw it in the films, but it, the actual set is absolutely ma- amazing, and it's a what, what we call a 360 degree set. So no matter where you look, you always see the Great Hall, mm. and you really feel like you're there. Wow. Eduardo and Mira, I'd like to hear how you worked on the crest for the films, but maybe you should first explain a bit more about what you do as graphic designers. I think many people are not really sure what graphical design for films really is. Is is that right? Yeah, they think that we do like the posters and... The promotional. Yeah, Yeah. the marketing material, the promotional material, but is the the graphic design for films, the job that me, Mira and I do is we are in charge of all the graphic elements uh, in the film that can be from 2D pieces like maps, uh, newspapers, mm. uh, books, um, notebooks, whatever, those kind of things. And also we are also responsible for pattern designs, like for floor design, for walls, for wallpapers, for drapes, and even like gravestones in the cemetery. We, we have mm. to, to come up with the names and, and do all the engraving as well. So it's a, it's a very huge 
the, the range of work that the graphics department do in the film. Mm -hmm. and, and in terms of actually knowing what it is that you have to design for the film, people do often ask, you know, are you given a list or how do you know what things are required? Um, we need to always refer to the script and some of the information will be there because it might be in the dialogue or it might describe a, a, a particular environment. But for the most part, it's not actually written in the script any detail of, of what's needed in terms of all these ele graphic elements that Eduardo mentioned. And with the crests, I'd say that that's one of the few examples where they were quite well described in J.K. Rowling's book. So for the most part, she'll be quite clever at keeping the descriptions to a minimum. So it's up to the reader's imagination to interpret, for example, the Marauder's Map or how how some of the, the books would look or behave. She might describe more how things how, how it makes people react or how um, how it progresses the story. Um, but in this case, it really was a sort of example of something wholly graphic because she had described some of the key elements that were in those crests. And in those decisions about design, you're always trying to think, well, how best can I tell the story? And of course, in these cases, the story is about all those characteristics that we know, re referencing traditional heraldry, where you have a sort of hierarchy of perhaps an animal and uh, color and significance. And in real heraldry, there's a lot of very serious um, significance to every design element that is placed into a shield or into, into the construction of a crest, of a, say, a family crest. And a lot of that design was already made by the scenic designers because they were having to, to paint and apply these designs onto stained glass and onto walls. So we were kind of working in parallel with them to best describe these different characteristics. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe we could go over some of those characteristics house by house in terms of graphic design. Well, all we know really is that the animal and the colors, and of course the colors really help suggest personality. And I don't think it's any coincidence that Slytherin is green and silver, for example. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think in a funny way, those colors do speak to a kind of emotion of how you might feel when you look at those pieces, just as type the choice of typography make you feel about something. Mm -hmm. What could you tell us about the Slytherin and Gryffindor crests? Yeah, I think the lion motif is used so much in heraldry and it's all sort of down to the position of, of whether they're sort of standing with arms raised or whether they're lying down. And I think we really wanted all the creatures to feel very animated and feel very kind of alive and dynamic. And also to be, it's really important on a film for to have a clear read. So, um, and what I mean by that is that quite with practically everything we design, if it's seen at all, you may only have two seconds of screen time or if that of, of the thing that you've designed, it might be quite fleeting. So whilst we're kind of tempted to go off and put lots of detail into things and add some other elements, I think there was a decision to just keep the animal as the central uh, motif so that it is a really quick read and there's absolutely no, um, it's unequivocal as to what we're looking at. Right. And it was interesting how those, when, when Eduardo and I were working on Fantastic Beasts, which of course we had no idea would happen when we were creating the designs for Harry Potter. So we sort of had to retrofit and retrothink a lot of the ongoing designs that you see in Fantastic Beasts, knowing that they were decades before Harry Potter. So on the one hand, it was kind of challenging, but it was actually really nice to think, well, how would the crests be in a previous life at Hogwarts? And how would mm. they be applied to, say, school books and badges on clothes? And so that was quite nice to have to kind of revisit with a, a slightly different creative hat on the same motifs. Mm -hmm. And apart from the animals that is highlighted on each crest, was the colors as well were important, you know, the blue, the yellow, the green, and the red, to really identify 
those four houses. And as Mira said, we we own Fantastic Beasts. We had to go through that again. But also we've launched the Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone illustrated by us, by Mina Lima. And we had to go and reinvent again those crests. Wow. <laughs> or rethink them, yeah. Rethink them, yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned a second ago how you know, you might only see something for two seconds. And it just made me think, wow, the amount of work that goes into just even two seconds in a film. Yes. Yeah, but um, if you're creating a whole world for your audience, then you you do need to create the 100%, even if you only see 2% of mm -hmm. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, some, sometimes. There are other times, of course, where you you know where to cheat, whether you're making, you know, when you walk around the back of a set and see what's behind the stonework or, or yeah. up above where the candles are floating in, in the Great Hall and see what's really there or inside a book that looks like it's a real book. And so there are, of course, places where you need to cheat and um, filmmakers are the masters of... Um, of faking faking it because <laughs> otherwise we'd be there for sort of years doing for it sure, um sure. but eduardo and i do have a sort of design philosophy which is that um nothing must escape yes. um our attention from uh, the detail mm -hmm. and whether it's a tiny label on a bottle on a on a potion label or or whether it's a giant billboard you know everything is entitled to the same amount of design attention from us. But that was what was incredible about Harry Potter, that the details in all the departments, from costume to construction to painters, everywhere, the, the attention to detail is so phenomenal that mm. that even with the graphics as well, if, if you don't have, if you have too much white space on the page, you will notice. So, mm -hmm. uh, so you need to really go uh, maybe even overdo sometimes because right. is is what is needed. And actually now it's almost like a duty because we sort of think, well, we know that the audience notices. Mm -hmm. And on something like this where they're actually able to build it themselves at home, then of course they'll notice even more. So yes. we do feel a kind of a mutual obligation to the audience to deliver as much information and detail mm -hmm. and joy as possible. Yeah, and exactly. There's such Harry Potter mad fans out there that if something's left out, oh. they, they will notice. Yeah, and they will come shouting. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably listening to this right now thinking, I don't, I'm sorry, I, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> of course, of course, that's how it has to be. Yeah. I had the pleasure of actually visiting the, the Harry Potter studio some years ago, and I was really blown away by the detail level over there. There was like the thing that the painting, some of the paintings were part of the, the people who were making the movie. And there were some bottles in a closet where all the bottles... Oh, I, the memories. Yeah, they were different from each other. It was just like, whoa. <laughs> that was us, kid. <laughs> that was us, yeah. That was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and, and when you see the movies, like you don't even notice, but like just... Going there and, and seeing that is just like, oh my God, there's a lot of love put in this, in making that movie. Some people have said that um, exactly what you said, that, that you they didn't realize, but they said, oh, but now when I go and see a, another Harry Potter film or even another film, I will look at it with different eyes. And that's what has been great about having all these opportunities to share the craft and the filmmaking processes with the audience beyond the screen is that it helps sort of shape and understanding of what goes into it. And, you know, it's a conversation when you're making a film or you're making a, a I'm sure for you, Kit, when you're designing a, a new Lego piece, it is a conversation with your reader or your uh, maker or your audience. And it would be really boring if it was just one way. So Exactly. Yeah, Kit, maybe you could tell us a bit more about what had to be on each crest to make it instantly recognizable when you were translating the world of Harry Potter into Lego art. Yeah, but I so agree with uh, with Mira and and Eduardo because if like I would say the same. First of all, the animals needs to be it needs to be the right animal. And then comes the colors, and then uh, on the on the ones the quest that we have made for for Lego art, there's also um, the artifacts. But definitely, the, like from afar, the first thing you see is the colors and the animals. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree. <laughs> Gryffindors, follow me, please. Keep up. Thank you. This is the most direct path to the dormitories. Oh, and keep an eye on the staircases. 
They like to change. Oh, yeah, look at that. This one here, that one there, I'll put my headphones. Alan and Pierre, what, what can you say about the design of the common rooms? They are very special places. They really are the soul of the, the house. Um, they, through the colors and the, the details and the architecture, they, they, they are basically the, the house brought to life. That's the right way to say it. Um, Gryffindor is, um, like we know the Gryffindors as a house, they're, they're brave, they're daring. Um, they have a great history. They have um, Minerva McGonagall was their, their head. Um, we have nearly headless Nick who floats around the ghost. But it, their room is comfortable. It's got a big fireplace. It's got the lovely red colors. It's got the amazing tapestries on the walls. And then the coolest thing is you have, um, well, you have the entrance, the fat lady portrait, which is a really unique, great detail. Password. Caput Draconis. Wow. The dormitory room is really special. It's around and all the boys face each other. Like it's a circular room and all the beds, beautiful little four poster beds, all laid around this lovely room and an old cast iron heater in the center to keep the boys warm. And you're high, high, high above Hogwarts, way up in the towers. Welcome to the Gryffindor common room. Boys dormitories upstairs and down to your left, girls the same on your right. You'll find all your belongings have already been brought up. So the design for the room was very much came from the books and came from Stuart and came from J.K. Rowling. And of course, Pierre would be very much involved the whole journey as well, because he'd be creating a lot of the items in the space. Yeah, I mean, the, the Gryffindor common room was was, uh, was interesting. I mean, the lovely thing about it is that that boarding house feel, the fact that everything was, you know, hundreds of kids have gone through it throughout the years. So there was a, everything had a had a worn, slightly worn out feel for it. I know Stephanie McMillan, the set decorator, really worked hard to to try and give that that um, that feel and that that temper to everything that was that was made in there. Yes, but part of the journey we had with Stephanie and Stuart was that just the sheer level of detail that they would inject into every place. Um, like every book you could open, every book is fully there. Every page is illustrated. Every drawer you can open and there's something inside it. And it would be a beautiful object, maybe a piece of jewellery, maybe a letter opener, maybe a pen are some amazing objects to do with the Wizarding World. And it's all there. And there are thousands and thousands of designs created by the teams and absolutely beautiful in every way. You know, everything has character. I mean, we we never really got the chance to visualize too strongly Ravenclaw or Hufflepuff, apart from the, um, the Horcruxes. But certainly there was this lovely characterization that, that is emphasized in, in each house, plays into the choices that the characters would make. I mean, it's interesting that uh, Slughorn was a good example because he's, you know, he's interesting because he's probably more of a genuine Slytherin character than people would realise. He emphasises the strengths and the good parts of, of being a Slytherin um, in comparison to, say, Lucius, who, who emphasises the weaknesses, really. So it's interesting, interesting looking at um, what is his choices as a character, his love of pomp and his, his, his love of socialising and, and making environments where people are happy and enjoying and talking and gossiping and God knows what else. And so some of the pieces we made for him were, were a good demonstration of a house character, I suppose. Right. The really interesting thing about the Slytherin, obviously the Slytherin is, is deep down in the in the bowels of, of Hogwarts down there. And then the, but there's a slight pomposity to to uh, to that room, so the, sort of the tall ceilings, but there's all the deep green, the emeralds and the blacks that you have have in there. So, I mean, you know, we were doing items like door handles and little you know, sort of, um, snake influenced um, uh, fire grates and and uh, yeah, sort of items like that, and really just helping Stephanie um, uh, sort of uh, characterise these these rooms. Well, like Pierre said, it's 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 deep deep down. It's it's actually almost under the lake. So the 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 water is leaching through the walls. It's got this kind of damp feeling. It, it's very much the room is expressing their their characteristics. Their they're kind of the, the cunningness and the resourcefulness that they have. Um, the, their leader, Salazar Slytherin, it, it gives off a feeling of him. It just, it, the green color, like Pierre said, that the darkness, the shadows. It's it's not a warm place. It's a, it's a very unique, de- slightly devious place, an opposite, to, polar opposite to the Gryffindor common room. And I think um, the film design really brought the book's description to life. And it's it's a really interesting place. The architecture was based on, I believe it was Norman architecture, an old, old English architecture. We have these beautiful wall columns and wall details. And it was really interesting working with the construction teams, actually building all of this and getting it absolutely right. And Pierre touched on 
a huge part of the wizarding world in Harry Potter is patina and aging. It has to feel very, very old. It has to feel like it's been there at least a thousand years, and it does. When you go to these sets and places, you just feel, wow, these have been here forever. Was part of the creative process and planning going to really old castles or really ancient flea markets? What's that process like? Yes, we did visit many, many places. And in the early films, we actually filmed in real locations. So when the films got bigger and bigger and uh, more and more content from the books, we we ended up working in the studios a lot more. And we we then brought those real places back to the studio. We'd replicate them perfectly. Uh, We'd also use a lot of models. Um, Before visual effects became so big, we built many, many, many models. And we had a team designing the most beautiful models for many years. As you go closer and closer to the the castle in the films, you'd you'd start off with a model of the whole castle, then you'd go closer, then you have a model of a tower. Eventually, you'd have a model of a window, and then you go into the room or set. And it's really interesting to see that journey and how it's all worked out. Mm -hmm. Pierre, you crafted many of the iconic props for all of the Harry Potter movies. Can you first talk a bit about some of the designs that maybe we would remember? You know, we're talking about a, a series of films that lasted over 10 years and, uh, and the crews of, say, four up to 40 or 50 people at the time. So the amount of work was enormous. But, I mean, you know, there's the iconic stuff, the things like Wands, by example. I mean, they were a good, interesting example because they're such a characterful part of the world we're making. The other interesting thing about Wands is that they are a reflection of the character of the person they're made for. So it's very much the, uh, um, the demonstration of their tastes and, and experiences. It so happens that the phoenix, whose tail feather resides in your wand, gave another feather, just one other. It is curious that you should be destined for this wand when its brother gave you that scar. And who owned that wand? We do not speak his name. You know, it's not just a magical object. It's an object of style choice as well, and of period. And, you know, it's interesting doing the Fantastic Beast series of films. So looking at ones in the, in the sense of design of the period that they came from, sort of influences of Art Nouveau, the influences of Art Deco, the period coming in, which means that, that each wizard really isn't just when they get there. Uh, from Ollivander or whoever, whichever wand maker they go to, whichever when they get their wand at 11 years old, they'll keep the core of it, but they'll rehouse it over and over again. So you can go back to the wand maker or, or someone else and have it recased in, in whatever you feel at the time. Wands are interesting because they actually demonstrate a very human part of a wizard as well as obviously the, the magical part. What can you say about the house objects that are also included in the Lego art set? Let's start with the Sword of Gryffindor and the Slytherin Locket. Alan? It's an absolutely iconic object um, for the Gryffindor house. It's, it's a thousand years old. It's, um, it was owned by Godric Gryffindor, the founder of the house, and it was made by goblins. So it's a very special object and really has probably a lot of special powers to it. And it's, it's something that has appeared many times in my journey in the Harry Potter world. We've, we've recreated it multiple times both in the films and in the theme parks. And it's everybody I meet who sees it is just in awe of it and awe of the design. I'll chat about the Slytherin Locket being the opposing house. Um, It was originally owned by Salazar, the founder of the house, Salazar Slytherin, and it became a family heirloom for his family. Some way further time in in the history of Harry Potter, Tom Riddle managed to gain possession of the Locket and uh, he famously turned it into a Horcrux, which is a a very strong symbol in the world. And then finally, Harry and Ron managed to destroy it. So it's, it has an amazing journey, the Slytherin Locket. Mm-hmm. And what about the Ravenclaw diadem and the Hufflepuff cup? Huffle, I was trying to say that, Hufflepuff <laughs> cup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, the Hufflepuff puff cup. No, I, see, I can't say it now. The Hufflepuff cup. I can't say it again. <laughs> <laughs> the Hufflepuff cup. It, yeah, it's a lovely gilded gold cup. They don't. She doesn't really touch too much on on its backstory, etc., about what it was. But um, uh, it's a bit like the diadem. It's it's um, uh, of Ravenclaw. Um, it's just a, a an object that's very much linked to the founder of, of each house. It's almost like a tiara, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it was. It's a, it's a yeah. beautiful piece of jewelry, and it's it's very unique and it's very feminine in a way. It's um, the other objects can be quite masculine, but this it's a very feminine object for Ro- Ro- Rowena yeah. Ravenclaw. But it's, it's, it's amazing seeing them replicated in Lego. I mean, it's, it's definitely, 
you know, at the time that we were making them all, it wouldn't even enter our mind to think of them re envisioned in Lego, but it's amazing. And a beautiful job was done by, by Lego to make them. A beautiful job. I totally agree. Kit, was that a given from the beginning that you would include the house objects in the Lego art design? That's fu- that's a funny thing because, like, uh, we we uh, in Lego Art we are working with with partners, and in this case we were work- working with uh, Warner Brothers. And uh, what you do is actually that you work in loops. So you make something, send it to the partner, they look at it, and they give feedback. And what happened was uh, that the animals were were on the quests and the colors were there and uh, the background was there but then uh, Warner Bros was like maybe you can can uh, put the the artifacts in there as well and uh, that was just a very good add on to the whole thing because it gave it so much more dna and also for the building experience it ended up being more interesting to build in the end so it was a very good input take us through the process of what it's like having the idea of what you want the Lego art set to look like and then bringing it into fruition. What What is that process like? What is that process? I guess it's pretty much like Mirrors and Eduardo's. It's like first you have a bunch of ideas that you need to try out to kind of find the right path. So for in this case, what I did was actually I, I looked at the internet and looked at the different quests that was out there that was also made for merchandise that you can find in the different Harry Potter uh, merchandise shops. And uh, I started recreating them with all the details and ornaments and the name of the houses. And and in the end, it was just like, it was it became a mess for me because I don't have that many pixels to work with. I have 2,304 pixels to work with. And it like none of it was really recognizable. It was all be- becoming too small. So I had to take a new approach on it. And uh, that's when I got the artwork from Warner Bros. And uh, that was... That was very uh, eye opener because uh, very much eye opener because here the animals were pretty much in the in the foreground and they were more detailed than I was used to from the artwork that I found online. So what I did is that I took the out- outline of the animals and then I I recreated kind of a background that kind of went through all four of the the different other images so that they were kind of related to each other, and then. Um, I looked at the animals and they were they they had become rather flat for me because they were all in black. So I ended up making some if you can call it shadows in there with a, with a very dark metallic color to add some shape to all the animals. And then the artifacts were added afterwards. So that was the process of it. I don't know how you manage Kit. I just so impressed that you can <laughs> <laughs> that you know how to kind of consolidate all that choosing which piece to choose she's a wizard Mira yeah <laughs> Is, I'm a wizard yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have become <laughs> but I have I've been I'm learning a lot uh, still but it's a uh, it's really fun working with pixels it was was fun to work with pixels because I remember one of my first when I start my uni in 1992 um, my mm-hmm. first uh, lesson uh, in computer graphics was to design things mm-hmm. in pixels, <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> like very simple drawings like airplanes and cars, but like have to go and color pixel by pixel. So t- talking about pixels now with you know, the young generation that they are so used to Photoshop and things like that. <laughs> yeah, and there is like the, there's a big limitation in, in doing something pixelated. Sometimes it get more like a pictogram, right? Mm-hmm. Instead of being an actual picture. So it's all about finding the balance in that. Which, which is super interesting. Yes. Welcome to your first flying lesson. Everyone step up to the left side of their broomstick. Stick your right hand over the broom and say up. With feeling. Shut up, Harry. <laughs> what can you tell us about the teamwork that went into the Lego Art Crest? Yeah, it's like it's it's really much uh, like a, a teamwork when we do these sets. I am far from alone when I'm sitting sitting with this. Like as a designer, of course, you are responsible for for the model. But what you do is that you have so many other stakeholders that you talk to and partners in crime, I almost want to say. Uh, like, <laughs> I have a design manager and I have another designer that I talk to on a regular basis and we just discuss whether 
this looks oh, this looks right and uh, did i choose the right colors is the cropping right and with the um, with the other stakeholders like for example with the building instruction people that makes the building instructions afterwards i have a conversation about oh, can you can you differentiate the colors uh, how can we show this in a way that is like most beneficial for the consumer is there something they would like me to change in order for it to become a better experience because this is pretty much a big part of this whole experience like of course if you can't build it it's no fun so it's just as important that it's interesting to build as it is interesting to look at then we have uh, people that uh, makes the packaging as well and they also come with their inputs about how to make it look the best so we are a lot of people that are doing this together i'm far from the only one Mm -hmm. and mira and eduardo what's it like when you two first begin working on a project how do you work together we fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there's there, there's a there's a like a, a routine in our nomia where every time we start a new project, we immerse ourselves on the research time because that is one of the most nice part of of a new project is to do the research and find out. Especially in the film, you know, for example, now in Fantastic Beasts, we are back in 1920s and 1930s, so it's very good to go back in time and try to find out about typefaces and which kind of paper they were using. So we spend quite a lot of time on on the research bit. And after mm. we get the notebook, it starts sketching. Mm. The scary bit. <laughs> yeah. When you've got the white paper. Um, but we're naturally, I think, because we do work, you know, we have work as, worked for nearly 20 years as a team. Um, and I don't think we've done any projects on our own, have we, Eduardo? No. <laughs> um, so, we, yeah, it's a bit, bit, another big cheat. No, it, it, we do sort of joke and say that the sum of the parts is much greater than us being two individuals, which is kind of what inspired us to set up, to form a studio together and, and to continue working as a partnership beyond uh, being two freelancers on a film. And uh, when we are working together, we tend to be naturally drawn to different things. And although we share, a, a, we really do share a creative vision, I think, and, and a kind of language and a sense mm-hmm. of humor and all those things that are very important to um, make that creative marriage work. Um, we, in spite of that, we you do need to have um, different directions that you can take as as a partnership, um, so that you don't fight over the same things, and <laughs> um, and we we tend to naturally get drawn to to different challenges and and different kind of um, styles as well, I suppose. But um, I'd say we've pretty much merged into one um, strange beast by now. <laughs> yes, but I think uh, Mira coming from. Um, you study on your like scenic design and f- so you have a very good understanding of 3d perspective all that that kind of more technical stuff and and me coming from a more graphic design background so the the yeah uniting yeah, like those two elementary yeah those two points is is is, is good and, and i think another important thing that we I guess we'd always want to say to people who are um, aspiring or, or just working and, and, and are curious uh, in a in a similar industry is to always try and um, use your hands as much as possible because yes. the, what the computer can do is just unbelievable and fantastic and where would we be without it, frankly, now? But to know that that is underpinned by handwork at all points in your creative process. And I, I'm i sure Kit um, mm. would be in heaven with a little um, graph, a piece of graph paper and some colored pens and just examine those, <laughs> those all those squares and what she can do with them. But it's um, a very important part of our process is to keep the pencil, keep the pen and ink uh, work happening in parallel with or, or sometimes before you take it to the computer and then and then sort of it's like a it's got its own little um uh synthesis that it ha- that happens from the handwork through to the computer and then of course when you're making a prop for films it then comes back to being handwork because you might need yes. to age it and that's a very important that can never happen digitally really mm-hmm. Alan and Pierre what's it like seeing all this come to life in Lego art form 
Well, for me, it's uh, it's super exciting. Like I said, my family are huge Lego fans and anything to do with Lego, they just go crazy. So to see this happening is just another great extension of the, the journey of Harry Potter and Lego together. And we have most of the Lego kits and models that they've created so far for Harry Potter. And this is a very nice sidestep in a way to get into the smaller, smaller details of the world, like the house crests. Yeah, and Lego's such an enabler of imagination and of uh, allowing your imagination to run riot. And Lego allows you to imagine and produce objects with that imagination. Assuming that my calculations are correct, I believe that a change of decoration is in order. Gryffindor wins the House Cup. Art director Alan Gilmore, head prop maker Pierre Bohana, Lego designer Kit Kosman, and graphic designers Mira Foramina and Eduardo Lima. Thanks for joining us. You can see more about the work of Mina and Lima on minalima.com. And if you're ever in London, consider visiting their gallery and store, House of Mina Lima. Also, remember to visit wizardingworld.com for the sorting ceremony and so much more. Uh, one final question for you, Mira, Eduardo, and Kit. All three of you work in graphic design, and I'm sure a lot of our creative listeners feel that you all have dream jobs. So I'd like to know, could you see yourselves switching places? Oh my God. Oh my, I yes. I, I, <laughs> but I definitely need a lesson. Shall we swap it? We could do that. I, <laughs> I wouldn't mind. <laughs> and of course, even if we swapped, we'd definitely have to have a crossover. And, and I would that would be the best bit. And I always love going and seeing someone else's process. So if they're making marbled paper or if they're bookbinding or working with metal, it's always really curious to see how how those processes evolve so i think that would definitely be part of that would be my caveat if we if you made us swap andrea then we'd have to um meet somewhere in in the middle um on a boat and uh and, <laughs> yeah. and share our our skill set and then and then go off and, and have a have a go yes <laughs> yeah. yeah that's true we'd build the boat out of lego though <laughs> yeah exactly and kit would know how to make it watertight exactly <laughs> exactly exactly yeah and i wouldn't mind swapping either my education is actually as a fashion designer and with specialty in costumes so um I have done costumes before, so I I know the film world, and I think it's a, it's a lovely place. It's a it's super nice people to be around, and it's very inspiring. So um, I wouldn't mind at all. And doing the graphic work for it, that must be that must be so awesome. I was envious when I first I saw some interviews that you did, where you talked about how you had to imagine being Fred and George creating the <laughs> the, the boxes and everything for the magic shop, and I was like, oh man, I wish that was me. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, let's hope that Lego can bring us together. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the story behind the design of the Harry Potter movies, especially the house-related objects. How's your piece of art coming along? Are you getting ready to hang it on the wall? Maybe you're ready to break it apart and build one of the other versions or create your own. My name is Andrea Collins, and this has been an original soundtrack from Lego Art. <laughs>